Hi, I'm Walt from Delta Astrophotography. This is the beginning of Milky Way core season and I'm so excited because this is one of the most relaxing and easy forms of astrophotography. And that's because all you need is a camera, a tripod, and a lens. And maybe your remote, that helps. The photos I'm going to be taking are called Milky Way Nightscapes because I have a foreground and the Milky Way and stars in the background. So I'm gonna show you how I take those photographs and at the very end, I'll show you some basic Milky Way editing techniques. So I hope you stick around. So, so where, where exactly, exactly is, is this Milky, Milky Way? Way? That's a good question, Sagan. Before we can begin taking any photographs, we need to know where the Milky Way core is. Here in the Northern Hemisphere, you can see the Milky Way core from March to October. Right now is the month of April, and here in Mississippi, it rises around 1.30 in the morning in the South, Southeast. As we get later into the summer months, it rises earlier and earlier and more towards the South and Southwest. June is my favorite month because I can usually see it around 10 o'clock at night. We can use an app on our phone or computer to see exactly where the Milky Way will be. I use one called Stellarium, so let's check that out. So here we are in Stellarium. This is the PC version, but you can also get this on your phone as well. So first thing we're gonna do, I'm gonna click the clock over here and set it to the date I actually took the photo. There we go, just a few days ago. Right, now let's scroll over to the southeast we know that the Milky Way is going to rise somewhere in the south-southeast. And let's just scroll through the clock, see what time. All right, this is 1 o'clock in the morning, and as, as we can see, it is starting to appear over here. Let's skip over to 2 o'clock in the morning. There we go. Right there between the south and the southeast, it's rising right around 2. Let's fast forward a little bit. Yep, check that out. This app is great to know where the Milky Way is going to be. For the camera, any DSLR or mirrorless camera will work as long as it has full manual settings. Now these kind of cameras come in two main types, full frame and ASPC or crop sensor. A crop sensor camera has a smaller image sensor, so it makes your image more zoomed in. This will definitely affect how you use your camera and which lens you choose. And if your camera costs less than $1,000, it's most likely a crop sensor. I'll get to how all that works in just a minute. No, no I, wanna I wanna hear, hear more, more about, about lenses, lenses now. now. Okay, okay. So for Milky Way nightscapes, a wide angle lens is usually what I would recommend. The wider your lens, the longer you can do exposures without seeing star trails. It also helps to have a big aperture, which is a small F ratio number, something like F 2.8. That lets in a lot of light and helps capture more detail. So I would recommend anything from a 14 millimeter to a 24 millimeter. If you have the 18 to 55 millimeter kit lens, that is a great Milky Way nightscape starter lens right there. But other lenses I might recommend are the Rokinon 14 millimeter F 2.8 or the Rokinon 24 millimeter F 1.4. These are both fairly affordable, but they are manual lenses. They do not have autofocus and you have to set your aperture with a ring on the lens itself, like this. This is the Rokinon 14 millimeter F 2.8. Now for my personal shots, I use a Tamron 24 to 70 f2.8 zoom lens. I bought it for both astrophotography and travel and has been a great workhorse. It's definitely the most expensive lens I've mentioned, but it's still worth looking at. And that is the lens that I'll be using for this particular video. While we're taking long exposures of the Milky Way, it's extremely important that the camera does not move. It cannot be touched. So you will need a tripod. There's just no way around it. Any tripod will do. You can even use one of these cheap Walmart tripods, but I strongly recommend finding a good sturdy one with a ball head because a ball head allows you to move your camera very easily in any direction and lock it down with ease. Here's a tip I wish I would have known about from day one. It's called stacking. So once you take your first image and it looks good, don't stop there. Take a lot more, like 50 or to 60 more, but the trick is you can't touch your camera while you're taking all those. You use an intervalometer or a wireless remote, or even your cell phone connected to your camera with Wi-Fi. So you take about 40 to 60 pictures, and immediately after that, put your lens cap back on your camera and take about 20 more at least. And basically the reason we're doing this is we can load all these pictures in a free stacking software called Sequitor, or a not so free stacking software for Mac called Starry Landscape Stacker. But we stack all these images on top of each other, and it removes all the noise, the grain, the banding, our photo comes out looking crisp and clean and ready for post-processing and you can blow this up really big poster size and it looks amazing. And now it is time for camera, camera settings. settings.
Before we talk about our three main camera settings, which are shutter speed, aperture, and ISO, we need to make one change in the camera. We need to make sure that our camera is saving our photos as raw files instead of JPEGs. That's extremely important because raw files are unprocessed files and we can do more with them in post-processing. Let's go ahead and get the hard setting out of the way, which is shutter speed. How long can you open that shutter for before you get star trails? Well, you might have seen something online about a 500 rule. Well, screw that, I don't like it. I'm gonna teach you about the 400 rule instead. Very similar. Basically what this says is take the number 400 and divide it by your focal length to get the number of seconds to expose for. Now this is on a full frame camera. On a crop sensor camera, it's different because crop sensors are more zoomed in. I went ahead and did the math for you to include that crop factor, at least for Canon cameras. Instead of a 400 rule, for a crop sensor camera, use a 250 rule. 250 divided by your focal length of your lens gives you the amount of seconds. Let's break it down. Let's say we have a 24 millimeter lens and a full frame camera. 400 divided by 24 gives us 16.66666666667, whatever. I will just say 15. Let's just say 15 seconds. That's a good starting point right there. However, on our crop sensor camera, you would have to use 250 divided by 24, which gives you 10.8 something something something, just to say 10 seconds. 10 seconds is not quite as good as 15 seconds that you get on the full frame camera, so I would think that maybe 24 millimeters is not the best for a crop sensor camera. Let's try 14 millimeters instead. 250 divided by 14 gives us around 18, 18 seconds. That's a lot better. On a crop sensor camera, it's better to use a 14 millimeters because you get around 18 seconds. Now a 14 millimeter on a full frame camera gives us around 28 seconds. That's really awesome. There's only one problem, the 24 millimeter on a full frame camera can look a little fish eye, which means like the, the outer edge of the photos are gonna be bent in a weird direction. But if you don't mind that, then that's great. 24 millimeters gives you a lot of exposure time. For your aperture, I recommend using a low F number like F2.8. The lower the F number, the more light you're gonna let in. But if you have an F1.4 or 1.8 lens, I still recommend F2.8 because 1.4 is gonna be kind of messy. Now, if you're using the 18 to 55 millimeter and you can't quite go down to F2.8, then whatever its lowest F number is, F, F3.5, uh, that'll do just fine as well. Also, have you, ever, have you guys ever seen one of these things up close? I haven't, I didn't realize they were this big. Holy crap. And finally, there's ISO or ISO. ISO is kind of like the volume or gain knob on an amplifier. The higher you turn it, the brighter your photo gets, but you also introduce noise. The noise could also be called grain because it basically just makes your photo look grainy. If you're planning on just taking one single shot of the Milky Way, then maybe you shouldn't go too high. Probably no higher than 3200 or 1600. But remember when I was talking about stacking earlier? That's gonna take care of all the noise problems and you can use much higher ISOs as a matter of fact, for this photo, I'm gonna use 6,400. Damn airplanes. Okay, today's the day. But before we get started, we gotta talk about one more thing, light pollution. And for that, I'm gonna hand you over to John. Thanks, Walt. This is John from an abandoned bridge somewhere. About a mile or so behind me is the city of Clarksdale. It is a dumpster fire of light pollution, and it's only a small town. The bright lights from this city will completely wash out your Milky Way photos. I highly recommend looking at a light pollution map and planning a trip to a dark location in a green, blue, or darker area. And when planning your trip to take your Milky Way photo, I also recommend considering the weather and the phase of the moon. You do not want to drive two hours away only to get set up and realize it's cloudy or there's a bright moon washing out your photographs. Now I'll pass you over to Steve so he can talk to you more about the moon. Steve? It's so bright. Thank you, John and Steve. Indeed, the moon is bright. So I live in a pretty dark area, a light blue area on a light pollution map, but it's still not good for landscape astrophotography. There are all kinds of farms and street lights around this area. But behind me is the southeast where the Milky Way core is gonna be. So I'm not gonna go too far. I'm just gonna walk right across the road and set up over there. So let's go check it out. Thank you. 
So I really like this location to practice on. It's just wide open back there, just wide open sky. And the, the rows of what's going to be corn in a few months look very neat in the photo as well. Also, there's a house right over here. It's got a street light in the driveway and normally those drive me crazy, but that street light's actually gonna light up this entire field behind me. You don't really notice how bright it is at three o'clock in the morning, but after a 15 second exposure, this field is completely bright and well lit. One big problem you're always gonna have unless you're out somewhere in the middle of the desert or something, is you're gonna have light pollution on the horizon. There's just not much you can do about it. Behind me are many farms in the distance. They put out a lot of light, especially in the non-winter months. So that's just something we're gonna have to deal with. I guess it's time to wait for it to get dark. I'll see you back out here at three o'clock in the morning. Okay, it's three o'clock in the morning. I can actually see the Milky Way with my own eyes right behind me. All I have to do is point the camera straight that way. It's that easy. Now it's time to get focused and framed up. Okay, in order to focus, let's turn our camera settings up really high. We'll start with the uh, shutter speed, get it to about 30 seconds. For the aperture, let's get it to the smallest number possible, F2.8. And for the ISO, let's get it to the highest number possible. We just want the screen to be as bright as possible. Now we'll aim our camera at a bright star in the sky and turn on live view. Now we're gonna use the zoom button to zoom in on that star and turn the focus wheel until it is as small of a pinpoint as possible. That looks a bit fuzzy. There we go. That looks about right. If we turn too far, it gets fuzzy again. So we'll go back the other way. There we go. Another extremely important thing to do is to level out your camera because you don't want to take crooked pictures. That can be done on most cameras. With the Canon camera, it's as easy as pressing the info button. Now we see the level on the back of the camera. Just move it around until the line turns green. There we go. Now we don't have to worry about getting straight pictures in the dark. Now that that's done, I'm gonna go ahead and set my camera settings back to the way I want them. And as you can see, we're gonna have a shutter speed of 15 seconds, aperture of f2.8, and an ISO of 6400. Now it's time to take the first test shot. Let's see what this looks like. All right, let's see what one single test shot looks like. And there we go. That looks awesome. There, there's a better idea of what it might look like. No special effects in Photoshop. That's just what it looks like right on the back of the camera. Now it's time to just set it to take 60 photographs, go home and relax for a little while. When that's done, I'll come back out here, put the lens cap back on and take about 20 dark frames and then I'll be done for the night. So see you in the morning. All right, now that I've got all my photos loaded onto my computer, we're gonna stack them all in a free Windows software called Sequitor, so we'll have one nice clean image. Then we're gonna do some extremely basic edits in Photoshop. Nothing special today, I don't want the video to be 45 minutes long. I'm just gonna show you enough basic edits to get it onto Instagram. After that, I'll show you the same image, but after I spent 45 minutes on it using some more advanced Photoshop techniques. And in my next video, it will be all about advanced Milky Way post-processing. So let's jump into it. Okay, here we are in Sequitor. Let's start by going over to Star Images, right over here in the corner, clicking that. And let's add our light frames, or our actual pictures of the Milky Way, by clicking the first one, holding Shift, and clicking the last one, and select Open. Now let's add the dark frames. They call them noise images here. So we're gonna click that, come down to our dark frames, select all of those, and hit open. Now we're gonna select where to save the file by clicking output. I'm gonna save it in this final from Sequ Sequitor folder and just call it milk for YouTube and click save. Now, let's come down here and click Accumulation. We have to click Freeze Ground because when in, it aligns all the stars between the photos, we do not want it to move the ground at all. So let's click Freeze Ground. Now we can see the sky region has turned red. So we have to tell it where the sky is. So we'll click Sky Region. 
and paint in our, our sky, just like this. Easy as that. If you mess up, you can just right click and it gets rid of it. Use the mouse wheel to change the size of the brush. Very easy to do. Okay, that looks good to me. I'm gonna come down here and just click start. All right, now it's done. Just click close here. Here's our stacked image. Now let's check it out in Photoshop. All right, now we're open in Photoshop, but before we begin, let me show you a single unstacked image. Here it is, let's zoom in a little bit. You can see all this noise in between the stars. That's just awful looking. Now let's go to our stacked image. Let's zoom in. And there is no noise, it is clean. Our stars are good and round. It looks great. So let's get to work. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is duplicate this layer by hitting Control J, or Command J on a Mac, I think. And we just want to always have this background or our original layer intact in case we ever mess up and wanna go back to it. All right, let's get started. We're gonna be doing most of our work in Camera Raw Filter. So we go up to the top and click Filter, Camera Raw Filter. You can see all our controls here. We're gonna start with the Basic tab. Temperature controls white balance. A lot of people like more of a cool blue photo. I personally don't like it to be too blue. I don't want it to be real orange either. Just find a good balance here. It looks all right to me. I'm gonna bring my exposure up just a touch to bring out a little bit more of that Milky Way, but I'm also gonna bring over the contrast to darken everything and the blacks to the left just a touch. And what I'm seeing right now is the sky is definitely getting darker, but our corners are getting dark too. It's vignetting. So let's take care of that. We're gonna come down here to Optics, click that, and bring up Vignette. There we go, it took care of that. If you took just a single photograph of the Milky Way and didn't stack anything, you might wanna do some noise reduction right around here. Just click Detail and slide over your noise reduction until it starts getting cleaner. But you don't wanna to go too far beyond 20 or 30 because you really start losing detail and it gets fuzzy. See, that just doesn't look good. Since I stacked images, I'm not really gonna use much noise reduction right now. I'm just gonna turn it to eight. Now from here on out, I'm gonna to try to work on the sky and the ground separately, and we'll do that with graduated filters. So I am going to click graduated filter. It's this little square up here in the toolbar. I need to make sure that all these are set to their default position by clicking this little button right here to reset. And now we're gonna drag this filter down to where I'm editing the sky area. So a little, maybe a little more contrast. Black's in a touch, but no, that doesn't really look very natural. So we're gonna leave that alone. Maybe a touch of clarity. You don't wanna go too much clarity though because it kills the color and it also introduces noise, although it does have kind of a cool effect too. We'll bring it up a little bit. Touch of dehaze. Don't want to go too crazy with that either because it gives everything a purple bluish color. Just a little bit. And I'm going to leave that alone and hit OK. Let's go back in the camera raw filter again and do the ground. Filter. Camera raw filter. You can see this, this corner over here is getting a little dark, real shadowy. So let's go back to graduated filter. Make sure all these are reset by hitting the reset button right here. All right, I'm gonna drag our graduated filter up from right down in that corner. And I'm going to take the shadows and pull them up. There we go. That looks much more even. Click OK. Now I'm gonna do a technique called dodging and burning. We're gonna make certain areas of the Milky Way brighter and certain areas darker. But first, we need to create a new stamp layer. That's basically gonna mix everything we've done down so far and put it on another layer on top. This is a non-destructive workflow, so we can always come back, delete a layer, and go back to where we were before. We do that by hitting Control, Alt, Shift, and E all together. On a Mac, it might be Command, Option, Shift, and E. See, it created this new layer over here. We're gonna go over here. It might look like a fist or a lollipop. I'm gonna start with the dodge tool. You can right click on this to change between them. We're gonna make sure it's set to midtones and our exposure is around 16%. We're just gonna kind of click on some of the brighter areas of the Milky Way core. Don't wanna to go too crazy with it. 
Oh, there we go. So bringing out some of that core detail, adding some contrast. Now, if you go too far, you can always go to opacity right down here and just turn what you did down a little bit. I'm going to bring it down just a touch, maybe 80%. Now that was dodging, now let's burn. That's going to make the dark areas darker. Let's create a new stamp layer for that. Control, Alt, Shift, and E. Okay, go over here to the lollipop, right click it and change it to burn. Make sure we set up the shadows up here and exposures around 15 to 10%. I'm just gonna click on some of the darker areas. Just adds a little bit more contrast. See some of these dust lanes coming out. All right, turn my opacity down just a little bit. Let's do another stamp layer. Control, Alt, Shift, and E. And let's do one final camera raw filter. Filter, camera raw filter. And let's just do a touch more of clarity and turn up the vibrance and saturation a little bit. In my opinion, that's still a little bit too blue. I want to see what happens if I turn the temperature back. Yeah, that, I like that better. Now, when I turn the vibrance up, I do see a lot of orange here from the, the light pollution from this farm over here. And I could try to tame that by going down to Color Mixer, clicking that, and bringing down these yellows just a touch. But I don't want to go too crazy with it. I don't want to lose a whole lot of that color in the Milky Way either. But that should be enough right there. And I'm going to click OK, and we're just going to be done with this. So here's our before and our after. Before I show you my final fully edited photo, I just want to say thank you guys so much for watching. I love the comments. Please comment some more. Let's talk. Please like and subscribe. And as always, clear skies. We'll see you in the next video.